and let you get going. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, hello and welcome. So thank you for joining us in this in this session. So what we're going to be doing is talking through our experience of building effective learner interventions supported by, by data. Uh, we're going to start with a brief introduction uh, to the work that we've been doing at BPP University Law School and explore some of the considerations we've had to make during our work on, on learning analytics. So this will be a, a bit of an interactive session, so there'll be opportunities for you to answer some questions and then also uh, collaborate on a, on a shared document as well uh, during the session. And we'll be sharing everything afterwards, so all of your input will help us write up our own experience with a bit of a, a, a wider context as well. So to introduce ourselves, I'm Tom Pironi. I'm the head of learning innovation at, at BPP. Uh, I've been working on the, the law school redesign project for the last uh, two years or so. And I'm Lucinda Bromfield. I'm a senior lecturer in the law school, practiced as a solicitor before moving into professional legal education. I've been with BPP about six years now, and I've mainly been involved in the learner intervention aspect to just bring more of a lecturer perspective to it, and because I'm particularly interested in how we support students to develop professional skills and attitudes, so things like identifying their skills gaps, reflections, adapting to adverse circumstances, all that sort of thing. Great, so to jump straight in, um, we'll give you the, the, the quick context. So at, at BPP, we've been, we've been pretty busy. So for, for the last two years, uh, we've been redesigning all of the core uh, law programs, uh, so that's the GDL, the LPT, the BT, BPTC, uh, and that's to, to meet new regulatory regimes set by the SRA, the Solicitors Regulation, a regulatory authority, and the BSB, the Bar Standards Board. Uh, and through the opportunity that comes with those regulatory changes, we've designed those programs to be basically highly relevant for the next generation of, of legal practice. So this has been a massive undertaking. It's, uh, it's a complete redesign of every program offered in the school. Uh, and so we took the opportunity then to, to rethink how we approach learning and teaching and, and offer a level of consistency across across all of the programs. And, and this is what we came up with. Uh, so this is the law school uh, learning framework. It's a cyclical approach that encapsulates a, a single workshop of learning as well as the program as a whole. And it moves through the four primary stages, which are prepare, apply, collaborate and consolidate. So students engage with Prepare before their classroom session. Uh, this is where we build the knowledge. It's uh, through the use of our adaptive learning platform, which is a platform called Century Tech, uh, as well as through academic readings and, and other content modalities as well. Students then take that learning, apply it through uh, the use of our virtual practice environment. So this is a, this is a new platform that we've built specifically for, for law students. It's a simulated uh, legal firm or a, a barrister's chambers, depending on, on the program you're studying. And it's essentially an opportunity for students to, to be given real world tasks based on extended case studies. Uh, and we use this to draw on students' prior knowledge and experiences uh, and kind of contextualize that academic knowledge into, into actions. It's the, the opportunity to, in a real world environment, provide that connection between the taught theories and the, the, the practical application. We've then got Collaborate. That's largely what we would consider to be the, the, the classroom, and that's whether it's online or in person, but it's designed to be, to be active. And then we move through our consolidation activities, and this essentially acts as a, as a recap of the week, asking students to engage in uh, assessment level formative questions and also provide a link to the, the upcoming content as well. You will notice that assessment sits uh, slightly off on a tangent, and that's not to say that assessment is disconnected from the learning across these programs, but instead because the law programs are regulated by external bodies, uh, they've, they've centralized those assessments. So this has been the case for barrister training for, for many years, uh, but it's entirely new for, for qualifying solicitors. So although our students are working toward a BPP level seven qualification, and we are aiming to develop competent and confident lawyers, we're also preparing them for that centralized assessment. So on this slide, I'm just giving you a quick snapshot of what a student sees whilst they're on our, our programs. So on the left is our, is our VLE. The top right is the adaptive learning platform, Century Tech. And at the bottom is the quick glance to the landing page of our uh, virtual practice environment. I won't speak too much on these platforms. Uh, you're more than welcome to reach out uh, and, and, and get in touch if you want to know more. I, I can talk about this stuff for days. Um, the purpose of this slide was more to indicate that there's actually quite a bit more tech than has previously existed in the law school. And as you can imagine, this leads to, to quite a bit more uh, data generation as well. 
So BPP has close links with legal employers. A lot of our students are sponsored by their future employers. And in planning the redesign, there were lots of conversations with the legal profession about what skills, knowledge, attitudes, they thought that their future solicitor trainees and pupil barristers were going to need to succeed in their chosen career. And as you see from the slide, um, there were lots of things that came up. Um, some examples improved digital skills, financial and business skills, commercial awareness, willingness to embrace innovation and technology in the profession, networking, team working, personal well-being skills, so resilience. And interestingly, legal knowledge very rarely came up. And when it did, it was just, oh, and they need to know. Obviously, they need to know the law because that's just assumed as a given. So, given that there's this huge range of skills and attitudes that are going to be helpful for our students to succeed in their future careers, then the question for us was, well, how do we best support students to develop those skills and attitudes, as well as passing the required assessments, and how could learner analytics contribute to that? Okay. so. Our students are engaged in our programs. We've got all these new platforms. We've got all this new information. Uh, so what is it we have and, and what are we doing with it? Um, we've got our student information systems. We've got so Century Tech, which internally we've called uh, BPP Adapt. We've got our virtual practice environment. We've got the VLE and we've got all the additional systems. So things, you know, the library, our uh, support teams and basically everything that we, we don't have a snappy name for. Um, so then what, what are we doing with it? Well, we've worked closely with BPP's uh, data team. So this data team, they've already had quite a successful data project within the organization, but it was focused mainly on professional qualifications in the, the accountancy space. So it's known as the exam success indicator. And what it does is actually look at the students' uh, progress through the materials and determines whether or not they're ready to go for the centralized assessments for accountancy. Now, it's been very well received. It's it's proven to in, increase pass rates for for those students doing those professional courses. But from a law school perspective, from a university perspective, we felt that we needed something a bit more because it focuses on those professional qualifications. It, it focuses on learners that are actually with the organisation for a, a matter of weeks. It's just while they do those courses that prepare them for the papers, not a full degree program. So after all, our students will be with us through through the GDL conversion if they don't come from a law background and then move through the, the, the solicitor's course or the barrister's course. Or our degree apprentices could be with us for up to six years. So we've had to come up with an approach that provides the data to drive the dialogue between tutors and students, but doesn't dictate it. You'll see here that I've separated out the subject and personal tutors. And now we recognize these are the same people. Uh, but with those individual hats on, they have very different roles. And the data doesn't change, but the purpose of that conversation does. You'll also notice that we don't actually have reports for students to view their own progress. And this is a, a, a conscious choice, but it's, it realistically is based on the constraints of an unideal world. We're working very hard to bring through student dashboards themselves, but we also recognize we're not, we're not actually there yet. Uh, I will caveat this by saying students do have a data dashboard within Century Tech. We just don't have something that, that combines it all together in a single place. So by no means are we hiding any of the, you know, the fact that we're doing this data project. We're, we're working with students to make it very transparent. And students have, ac have access to all of that, just unfortunately not in a single place. We're trying to get there, but we're not there yet. When we started thinking about this and thinking about introducing the idea of learner analytics, we had a lot of informal conversations with both education and legal practitioners, and we got some pretty mixed opinions about what, how they felt about the idea. So we had everything from some people were all for it to people feeling it was too much like a, a big brother idea um, and there were a lot of people who felt that because we're dealing with students who are adults who want to pursue professional careers it's actually up to them to make the most of their studies and to ask for help if they need it so we're really interested to see what you think um, so if 
you could take um, 30 seconds and let us know whether you would actually like to have more learner data um, about your students and you think it would help. Um, that would be done. Thank you. I'll give it another second or two. And we'll close it off there. I'm just going to take a quick screenshot of that for later. Um, OK, so I don't think there's any major surprises there. Um, most people were toward the, the the more positive end of the end of the scale, and in the project at the start of the project, a lot of us on the, on the project team felt felt exactly the same. We we knew it would be what we, we believed it would be effective, um, but we also realised we actually had to define what more effective uh, means. So in terms of pure data, this is where we arrived. So at the top, I will say this is a dashboard that comes straight out of Century Tech, so not one that we've we've built ourselves. Um, what it does is provide a class overview for a, a specific uh, topic area. So it's a spread of engagement uh, by the, the scores achieved in the, the multiple choice questions that, that pair up with the content. So very simply, in that matrix, you're looking at time spent over, over score. But it gives just that nice snapshot of the rat once they've done those, those prepare activities. At the bottom, then, you've got what we've started to build out in, in Power BI. This was um, sort of a high-fidelity prototype that we put together. And here, we're able to actually then drill down into, into an individual, and we're able to see their actions against each of those stages in the learning cycle. We can see which parts have, have more engagement, less engagement. And again, we can drill down and see what that really means. So what aspects of prepare did, did students engage more with or less with? Same with apply, same with collaborate, and same with consolidate. We can see then that engagement over time. But it did raise then that we've got to actually you know, consider our, our actual tutors. Uh, and it raised two major considerations for us. So one, do our tutors have the confidence and competency to be able to use these data dashboards? effectively by our own definition and also then do they have the time and exactly how much time do we expect already time poor faculty members to have in order to engage with this properly so we've had to develop a strategy that engages all faculty uh, to, to, to work with these dashboards both efficiently and effectively so to bring it back to the room we've got another question here what does more effectively mean to you so i'm just going to share a blank whiteboard space um, you should be able to see that now. Up in the top left corner, you've got uh, a few different options. There's text tools. And what I'm just going to ask for is anybody in the session just to, to choose the text tool and, and add some notes. What does more effectively mean to you? I need to give you text tools. OK, probably should have thought about that. I remembered it. <laughs> just enable those. So hopefully people have access to those, and they'll start scribbling away for us. Okay, so we've got some interesting things coming up here. Um, increasing student confidence, actionable intelligence. I'll be interested in hearing a bit more about what that um, describes. So we've got a couple of those. Um, Identifying areas for improvement for the course and individual students. Um, achieving the learner outcome success, just generally. Um, and improved self-regulated 
learning. What I'm particularly liking is there's um, the comment about context dependent, because obviously it's going to be different. The different students are going to need different things. Um, Tom, do we have time to ask whoever it was who wrote about ah, intelligence in the sense of information coming to staff? Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, so they're getting the data they need to then be able to support the students. Yeah, I would I would agree with that comment as well, that success will look different to different students. It's what the student wants to get out of it. Um, and ideas around deep learning as well. This is all really helpful. Um, I think given time constraints, I probably need to move on to talk about what we hope it'll do. And actually it's, it's all of these things and I'll give some more concrete examples um, in a minute. So did anybody want to add anything else before I move on? No? Confidence not. Yes, very true. We don't want people with, with false confidence and that, that can happen. So what we really want is we want students to have a, a realistic um, picture of where they are and to, to be able to understand for themselves and identify what they might need to do to get to where they want to be, um, which fits in with the self-regulated learning. Better student support. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to stop sharing the whiteboard there and I will take us back to the slides um, which should come up there we go hit the share now button and we are here um, so what I was going to do um, just quickly is sort of talk about what we hope that the tutors having access to this data is going to do. And I'm going to keep it split between the two roles, subject and personal tutor. There will be some overlap, um, but just for clarity, I've, I'll keep it separated out. So for subject tutors, we are looking at improving the student academic experience and outcomes. And subject tutors are going to be able to see all sorts of useful things like are students taking longer than expected on the preparation? Are they doing the preparation? Are there certain topics or exercises that seem to be particularly problematic for them? And are there any individual students who seem to really need additional academic support? So for example, they're spending a long time, but they don't seem to be getting any results from that. So tutors should get advanced warning of what to expect when they walk into a class with that group and what that means is they can adapt their teaching in advance so um, when I'm teaching on a more traditional program I normally start by asking my students how they found um, the preparation and, and how things are going for them but I'll already would have had a snapshot of that and I could go oh look they're struggling with this so maybe I need to put aside more time in that session to cover those issues also means that subject tutors can intervene earlier if it looks like a student isn't engaging um, and worried about them and by intervene all I mean is open a dialogue with that student to talk to them about what's going on and to see whether they need additional support. And at a subject team level, then we'll be able to identify whether there are any exercises or materials that just don't seem to be working particularly well for students and therefore to refine the design of the modules as well. And in terms of personal tutor, we're really looking at improving student support. So we're hoping we'll have earlier, more targeted interventions, and those could be at student group or cohort level, depending on what the patterns in the data show may be necessary. And that will hopefully lead to earlier referrals to other BPP and external services. So signposting where necessary, for example, to learning support or to um, wherever it is that's appropriate for the student's particular individual circumstances. So sorry okay. to interrupt, Lucinda, this is a five minute call. Ah, in which case I shall wrap this up quite quickly um, and say that what we, so it's just about getting to the, the to support to the students earlier. So um, 
what we hope to do in the last five minutes is um, Tom is going to share a Google document and then what we're going to ask you to do is navigate to the document, pick whichever one of these questions most interests you and just tell us what you think and then we will be sharing all those thoughts later. Yep. So when you get to the Google Doc, I've, there's a table of contents at the top. They are direct links that will take you to the page for each question. Um, it's just an empty page for each question. Just write a few notes down, whatever means the most to you. Um, we're going to share this openly at the end with uh, the, the whiteboard and, and the poll at the start. And we're also going to then produce a, a, a write-up. So using all of your notes based on all of, all of your thoughts and, and perspective on all of this and contextualize it again within the project that we've been working on to basically help us refine what effective analytics means to us and also hopefully produce some useful guidance for, for other people who undertake a, a, a similar project. So, so there's a few people starting to write notes in there now. That's brilliant. And I can see that one of the comments is about how you would find the time to um, look at the data and, and fulfill that role. And that is a very key concern. Yeah, under hidden dangers, we've got making assumptions about what the data means, which is something that we've we've worked kind of really hard to, to kind of mitigate against this. We've given suggestions of what these things could mean, but more so on the basis of, of whether it requires an intervention and a conversation rather than a direct kind of outcome of, of directing the data. Yep, so when we've been um, talking to tutors about this, um, providing training to tutors about this, we've really emphasized the point that all the data does is give you an indication that there might be something to have a conversation about. It absolutely does not tell you what is going on with the student. So knowing your student is still absolutely key and you need to have that conversation rather than making those assumptions. Yeah, there's a really interesting point there as well. So as a student, I'd be happy, uh, unhappy with this kind of data being shared. Um, that note's being finished, our oh, prospective employers. So this is, I suppose this is an interesting one to contextualize for us. So within BPP, we, with the law school, we have a lot of students who are sponsored by, by our clients. And these are, so there's students who are already technically employed. Um, so it's not so much prospective employer as it is, you know, your actual employer who's, who's trying to support you get through the program as well. But we've got an interesting mix then between what we share. We don't certainly don't share every aspect of the data and we don't leave em employers to then make assumptions of what that data means. Yeah, so when we were debating this, there was a very, very strong feeling within our organisation that it is not helpful for anybody um, for things like formative assessments or how a student's doing at any given point to be shared with an employer because it's not necessarily remotely indicative of you know how they're going to get on at the end and it it you know it just adds an additional pressure that's really unhelpful it does not make for a good learning environment i can yeah. see that as we're just approaching the time now that we've just had a question come in on the chat from lee which says um it's probably be i should imagine the uh, the last question really that we've got time to answer but it says is there a connection between this project and JISC's learning analytics tool set um the connection is is we are heavily influenced by the the the, the guidance that just put out. So we've um, we we basically use that as our kind of starting point. So every lesson that we've got is is work that other every lesson that we took on from the start is is work that we've understood from from other people. Uh, we've taken that away and tried to apply our own context to it. So it's by no means it's 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 not hugely different. It's just a different approach where we we've taken that influence there. So. 
we've we looked at a lot of the student guidance and so making sure that we're very transparent about what we're doing and how in what ways we're working with students with this so again to bring it back around we don't necessarily have those dashboards but we're not hiding the data from students we're, we're letting personal tutors engage with students using the data as well um it, it's more just the, the you know, tech issues but we've taken a lot of influence then from greenwich who have published all of, all of their information that they give to students direct on their website. And it's really just kind of helped us to make sure that we're, we're on the right lines when we're doing this, this work. Um, but we'll, yeah, we, we can leave it there. Uh, so we've just, I've just flicked over the slide to the, the contact. If you do want to get in touch, you're more than welcome to uh, drop, us, drop us an email. I will note my email is slightly different. So next week is my last week at BPP. So you are more than welcome to um, reach out to my, my new email I'm, I'm going back to London Business School or you can get me on Twitter um, but we will be sharing um, our write-up of this session we'll be sharing the the document that you've all helped us collaborate on um, I'll be putting that out on Twitter with a, a time frame for people to add to it before we start writing that up and share it back with you all and um, thanks very much for coming along Thank you so much um, for that presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. And let's all find the clap function in um, our chat and say a big thank you um, to Lucinda and Tom for that session. I very much enjoyed that. So thank you so much.